next speaker is the Honourable Tim Fisher. Very well known to all of us as our former Deputy Prime Minister from 1996 to 1999. He retired from Parliament in 2001 to take a more active hand in the raising of his children. He later served as Australia's first resident ambassador to the Holy See between 2008 and 2012, and of course in that time was very involved in the canonisation process for Mother Mary MacKillop of the Cross. And since then, has written a book which I believe he might even be prepared to sign for people afterwards. Please make him welcome. Thank you very much, Sandy, for those kind words of introduction. The Archbishop Gallagher, His Excellency, the Papal Nuncio, not so long in Australia, but in a very bold move, decided to go to Broken Hill on his first Easter in Australia. And I think that caused a lot of us to uh, take note, and uh, we were just delighted that that uh, uh, city of a few difficulties uh, had, for that particular Easter, an Archbishop who was prepared to risk everything and move outside his comfort zone. Uh, and head to Broken Hill, and I commend him on that and his address tonight. Uh, joined also by uh, uh, Bishop Gerard Hanna, who uh, in a sense joins uh, that diocese uh, from Wagga Wagga, and uh, it's a privilege to be speaking sandwiched between an archbishop and a bishop. Anything could happen here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and also to recognise that uh, Bishop Hilton and Bishop Tomlinson from Sandhurst joins us, and of course, yes, there is a book, I would say other than the fact that there is a page formally dedicating this book to the late Bishop Joe Greck of Malta and Melbourne and Sandhurst, a good friend, and uh, I made a trip to Malta with him for the uh, ordination of Rob Gallia, and uh, it was always a great privilege to listen to what Joe Greck had to say on the matter of migration and refugees, and I... Uh, uh, I think the spirit of Joe Greg is alive and well here tonight. To Father Maurizio and Father Fabio, to all the members of the clergy, ladies and gentlemen, friends. I want to begin with a quote from the encyclical Caritas in Veritate, which came out uh, just ahead of the G8, delayed a couple of weeks in extra translation problems. I uh, almost missed the boat because Pope Benedict was keen to get it out about a fortnight before the G8 meeting in Rome in Aquila. Uh, it came out the day before. But Pope Benedict wrote and said, Charity and truth, to which Jesus Christ bore witness by his earthly life, and especially by his death and resignation, is the principal force, driving force, behind the authentic development of every person and of all humanity. And he went on to... Uh, uh, remind us of uh, ethics and integrity in business in particular with regard to that magnificent encyclical. But there is a dignity associated with the human being, and that is regardless of race, of colour, of location, of wherewithal and capability. And in a sense, that is what I'm here to address tonight in, uh, as a private citizen. Uh, now, ex-everything, ex-ambassador, ex, -everything, ex Minister of the Crown, ex-State Parliament in Sydney and ex-Federal. And I'm, I'm delighted to do this because I wanted to build on what Archbishop Gallagher said to the next stage of the practical levers that can help ease poverty for refugees and for migrants coming to Australia. And the first element must be education access to education, the ability to uh, uplift newly arrived migrants and refugees as we have done over decades, those who have come through the front door, to ensure that they've had uh, a degree of access here at magnificent ACU and I do thank you Professor John Ballard for the welcome and ACU for their hospitality tonight uh, for this colloquium. Now. I think sometimes the media smear the newly arrived refugees and migrants and have done so over the various cycles, including, for argument's sake, the huge wave of Vietnamese boat people this country accepted in the 1970s and 1980s. 
By the way, Canada also accepted huge numbers of Vietnamese boat people. By the way, Japan accepted zero Vietnamese boat people. And guess what? The second and third generation of those Vietnamese boat people have become net economic contributors to the GDP of this country in a massive way. And also in Canada, a huge uplift uh, of a different cohort of being a very positive and dynamic contributor because they got access to, amongst other things, uh, to education. But and always the migrant, the refugee, will have a determination, a dedication, a motivation, sometimes far exceeding that of uh, uh, some Australians who have had even more opportunity in their lives than the arrived migrant and refugee. No one should besmirch the demonstrated motivation, dedication, determination of migrants and refugees with regard to seeking to better their lives, to learn to educate their children, and above all else, the first stepping stone in all of that must be in learning English, speaking English, being able to write English, and that is whether you've come from South Sudan, from Somalia, or from Vietnam, and wherever else it might be. I am in awe of the efforts that have been made by various Christian churches, various non-government programs and some government programs to provide that educational uplift for the migrants and the refugees. I take this opportunity at this colloquium here tonight to not only salute that, but to say we cannot step back from the several thousand that are scheduled to come through the front door this calendar year into Australia and more next year and the year after. The, the legally arriving refugees, the legally arriving migrants from all over the world, uh, we must be able to provide that access to English, better still, they might arrive being able to speak the main language of this country. And I salute the elders, and it's a great tragedy that many of the languages of yesteryear have now vanished from Australia, but let's get practical, and I just take this moment to digress to say I think a very serious problem facing East Timor uh, so many years on from uh, uh, the ballot, 14 years on from the ballot, is a curious decision of the leadership to impose as their official language in East Timor the language of, not Indonesian, not, uh, not uh, English, not Latin, not French, not Spanish, but in fact Portuguese. And Portuguese remains the official language of Timor-Leste. And that is a matter which I've been roundly criticised for raising and daring to raise in the presence of Jose Ramos Horta and Zanana Guzmao. But it's just a reminder that for the migrants, the refugees, there are lessons going on in Footscray, which I heard about again yesterday through the ABC Radio National Network of newly arrived migrants Again, going through that process of learning. Let us not forget the importance of that education stepping stone in language, but then, of course, moving right through to matriculation, right through to access to university education. And, of course, today, so many of our Vietnamese boat people, second generations, are now our doctors, our lawyers, our... Uh, Architects and, and much more, many others, are simply uh, very happy to be employed in the trades, uh, have jobs, work twice as hard as many others, and have made great progress in this country. Education uh, is what has brought that about, along with an embracing attitude, by and large, not always, uh, I might add, by Australians. But as part of that equation, there is a second dimension, and that is employment opportunity for the newly arrived migrant and refugee with the minimum requirements, minimum language requirements. There are, to some extent, without going into the current uh, election campaign, of which I'm not a, a direct part of, um, a series of dimensions 
which are making employment uh, opportunity not necessarily as open and as embracing as it should be to a South Sudanese, to uh, anybody else who has come uh, most notably through the front door, and I'll say a bit more about those who've come through the back door in a moment. And they too are human beings, let's not forget. But the um, employment, this is a country of 23 million people. It is an OECD country, which has much to be proud of on a range of research frontiers, has much to be proud of with a broad cohesion of its population and its economic progress uh, since World War II. It defies imagination that we cannot expand the employment base and have the flexibility in our templates to ensure that the migrant, the refugee, and the second generation, but the first generation, might gainfully obtain gainful employment at an early stage. Too often, this has not necessarily been the case. I would just remind that this colloquium the need for governments, federal and state, the need for business chambers of commerce, the need for employers, federations, and the need for all Australians to realise that these people are, are very valuable workers who are very motivated people. And I'll give you one example in particular, and that is Roger Fletcher of Dubbo, who made out of his way to employ Somalians and Sudanese at his abattoirs in Albany, Western Australia, and in Dubbo and elsewhere, as he exports lamb to the world, frozen packaged lamb, as he exports beef, as he exports wool to Mexico. Roger Fletcher started as a drover in this country with minimum education, with one ute and $100. Today, he leads a huge exporting company employing several hundred people, most notably at Dubbo in New South Wales and Albany. He goes out of his way to employ migrants and to employ refugees. And by the way, in a roundabout sort of way, not that he did it for this reason, every now and then the wheel goes the full circle. Guess who exports the most lamb to Libya from Australia, from any other part of the world? It is Roger Fletcher International. And after the Gaddafi regime collapsed, I met the families that were controlling and distributing for him around Tripoli and Tobruk when I was there about six months before the final hurrah of Gaddafi. I was sent there by the Australian government from Rome to do a particular job, one of which was not to shake the hands of Colonel Gaddafi, but to attend his banquet and slide past him and not get photographed with Colonel Gaddafi but should it be served, I was allowed to eat his lobster, <laughs> which I truly did. Um, within four weeks of the death of Gaddafi, Roger Fletcher had resumed exports because what happened in the interim? They killed their breeding stock. They were so desperate for food. And so they'd upset completely their supply chain in Libya. And today, Roger Fletcher is flying jumbo loads of lamb exports processed by Sudanese and Somalian and various other migrants and refugees through to the Mediterranean and most notably through uh, to Libya. So you've got to have the education and you've got to have employers prepared to ensure that there is employment available for these refugees and these migrants and so they don't get cocooned off into a source of poverty uh, and continuing poverty and desperate poverty, which there is too much of in this country, an OECD country of 23 million people. Those two broad points made, I want to cut through to just two examples. This way it gets down to the nitty gritty. And we take several thousand migrants through the front door, and we take several. Uh, uh, hundreds of refugees through the front door. I got rung up by Cardinal Filoni. Can you come in to the Vatican by sunset tomorrow? I thought, 
Oh my god, this guy is the Sasatuto. I've clearly done something wrong. I'm about to be whiplashed for daring to organise a Caritas Express steam train from the Pope's platform or some other outrageous thing which I got away with blue murder in my grand finale year. I was very worried. Uh, but so I was about to be placed on the index even before I'd completed writing my book. <laughs> he said, here's a list from the Holy Father. It's a list of Iraqi Christian bomb victims. A few months before, 50 people had been murdered at mass in one of the central churches, remaining churches, in Baghdad. And by the way, Papal Nuncio Filoni, I think I'm correct in saying, was the only ambassador to remain at post in Baghdad at that particular time of, uh, of uh, Gulf War I and, and subsequently, and is now gone to head up Propaganda Fide. He said, this particular group, some want to go to Canada, to other countries I can't name, and this lot want to come to Australia, where they have some rules. Will you take this list, present it to Canberra, and see if the Pope's list for a handful, but nevertheless some very desperate and wonderful people, that were they signed off by Canberra? And if you read the book, you'll see what methodology I used in presenting it to Canberra. I mean, thousands apply. Uh, this was a huge department uh, of immigration that would have to be dealt with by the Minister of Immigration and the then Minister for Foreign Affairs, Chris Bowen and Kevin Rudd respectively at that time. And so I sent the list off and I was quite worried about it. I employed a particular tactic. I just want to report to this colleague, William, that within 28 days, Canberra agreed to and signed off on the uplift of those Iraqi bomb victims on the Papal list are subject to medical checks, and they're now all living in Sydney and Melbourne. And so I think as we look at some of the publicity dominating in the recent weeks, we should also remember that Australia has stepped up minuscule on that one, quite large in numbers from uh, Bhutan and Nepal, uh, several thousand have come through on a special project negotiated through the IOM and the United Nations, again through the front door. What about the back door? I mean, it's the dead cat question sitting here tonight, which is not for me to dwell on. I'm not a contestant. I'm not a candidate in this election. And I'm a little bit rusty, having just spent a thousand days in Rome and the rest of the time feeding my wife's cattle because they're hungry this long, cold winter. I just want to say another thing. The church should never be underestimated. The Vatican should never be underestimated. We had Peter Woolcock, our roving ambassador, link up with Kathy Klugman in Colombo, Sri Lanka. And I came through and we had a working lunch with who? Cardinal Malcolm Rangif, the Cardinal President of the Bishops' Conference of Colombo and the newly appointed Cardinal now two years ago um, and uh, well known in Rome and now in Colombo. When he came back with his red hat, the president turned on a huge parade in from the Colombo airport. Thousands of people turned out, great big vehicle decked out uh, in Sri Lanka. And we said, we have a problem. And much of it is coming from the Christian fishing villages of the Ngombo coast. And we want to get a set of messages out. And the church then linked with the Sri Lankan government and with the Sri Lankan Navy, whose Admiral uh, Archbishop Gallagher might have met because the Admiral then is now the Sri Lankan uh, High Commissioner here to Canberra. And guess what happened, ladies and gentlemen? We did the very best thing because the Cardinal sent a message to the Bishop of Ngombo and the other fishing villages, which was very simple and very direct and read out in every single village along that coast. It is illegal, it is immoral. It is dangerous and it is deadly to get involved with the people smuggling by boat business and the business model might hold out false hopes for some money, but ultimately it will end in disaster. For two years under this current federal government and for many years under the John Howard government, zero boats from Sri Lanka. 
boats cut off absolutely at the source as a consequence of a holistic approach. And far better than possible. But they'd be cut off at the source rather than then have everything else that is being debated at the moment about which I cannot comment. So I just want to say there are good news stories out there and I salute someone many of you may not know but may have heard of uh, Cardinal Malcolm Rangiff in the Catholic Church of Sri Lanka, about 15% of the population, but a very influential networking population in making that difference. Subsequently, the wheels fell off a bit. Kathy Klugman, the High Commissioner, came back. Peter Walcott went on to Geneva and the like. But uh, cooperation at the source can see the best solution of them all, and that is to cut off the source. Let me just finally say, you just never know when something goes right in your heart. And so a letter from a person in Wodonga to me as a former member of parliament of the Aubrey Wodonga area arrived a week ago. Her brother is a civil engineer in Aleppo, Syria trying to seek a way out. Trying to seek approval to come to Australia. Married, three children, on a good day two hours of electricity a day. On a good day, one meal for 24 hours for their three children. On a good day, they're not woken by rockets full of canisters of steel pellets or gas, as may have been the case in the last <coughs> week, 36 hours in Damascus. How could I help? Well, if anyone has an idea, I'm welcome to pick it up in the colloquium in the discussion. It was a sharp reminder. Australia has to maintain an onward obligation for migration, for refugees. But as part of doing that, we must provide that education. We, by one method or another, we must provide an attitude with regard to embracing employment of those migrants and refugees. And we do so in the spirit of that great exemplar and teacher, Jesus Christ, of the first ever Papal Nuncio in my book, uh, St Paul himself, as he travelled so much around the Mediterranean and beyond. And we do so in the memory of Bishop Joe Greck and clearly, sadly, there is still much, much, much to be done. Thank you.